This Summit 2021 video on demand session is entitled Grading Bluebird PS, a PowerShell 7 Twitter automation client. Hello, I'm Dave Carroll, the creator and maintainer of Bluebird PS. My PowerShell journey began nearly 12 years ago, though the last three or so have been the most rewarding since becoming part of the welcoming PowerShell community. Feel free to pause here if you want to read a little more about me. Otherwise, let's continue right to the agenda. In this talk, we will examine the process I use in creating Bluebird PS. First, we'll ask the questions that anyone writing any module should ask themselves before they write the first line of code. After a short tour of what Bluebird PS can do, we'll then cover the basics of a REST API. Then we'll focus our attention to the Twitter API documentation, as learning any API is critical before writing your module. After learning about the API, we can use the REST API client to test out our API endpoints. Then we'll take a look at some upfront design considerations, such as PowerShell version compatibility. Next, we'll take a look at module structure, including authentication, private and public functions, output, error handling, and more. Then we'll talk about what's next for Bluebird PS. We'll finish up with some important links. The five W's have been used in journalism and other investigative endeavors. We use them to define the need and other aspects of the module. Why am I writing this module? Primarily, I felt the community needed a Twitter API module that adhered to PowerShell best practices, one that is open to input and involvement from the community. At the end of this session, there'll be a link to the project's online discussion. I invite you to stop by and join in. Early on, I've had a couple of people provide some code and documentation updates. There were a few discussion points that provided some direction based on feedback from PowerShell users just like yourself. This module is yours just as much as it is mine. Together, we can make it the best PowerShell resource for the Twitter API. The why serves as the motivation for writing the module. Who will benefit from the module? The module probably won't change your everyday Twitter usage scenarios. Replying quickly to tweets will still be the purview of graphical clients. Then you can reply from the command line should you choose. Searching for tweets beyond seven days is also a limit to the standard API. However, if you want to announce blog posts automatically, Bluebird PS can help with that. If you want a tool that can help you manage your Twitter list, Bluebird PS is that tool. If you have a list of Twitter usernames that you want to validate, you can do that too. Do you need to pull data from live Twitter feeds and save them into a database or a file? Yep, that's another good use for this module. For your own modules, you need to consider this question as well. Now, what are some usage scenarios? We've actually covered some usage scenarios already, but another idea that I had was to use this to automate the weekly PS Follow Friday tweets. We could pull for multiple curated Twitter lists and generate a random selection and then publish the tweet. Sounds great. Where would users find this module? Well, it's already available to download in the PowerShell gallery. You can also download the release versions directly from GitHub. When you're writing your own module, the answer to this question may be the gallery, or it may be a self-hosted repository behind your company's firewall. You'll need a, an easy way to distribute your own module to users. The last question, when will it be ready to ship? As mentioned, Bluebird PS is already available, but it's not complete. In fact, I have a huge update that's ready ready to be published. For any module, it's important to get it in front of users as soon as possible. When I published version 0.1.0, Jeff Hicks discovered an easy to fix issue that I missed in my limited testing. I quickly published a fix and it was all better. And it was thanks to community members' input. You're gonna to wanna to keep working on your module until it's polished. You want that code to be perfect before you send it out. But if you wait until it's perfect, no one will ever see it because it'll never be perfect. The idea of a minimally viable product is quite prevalent with developers. It's something that you should strive for as well. Now let us take a look at Bluebird PS in action. First, we'll take a look at a Twitter user. So here's the Bluebird PS account that I created last year to ensure that no one else would create an account with the same name. It's very basic, just the description, several URLs and the entity's property. Now let's search for hashtag PSH Summit.
Wow. That was a lot. Let's limit that res those results to 10. Then we can see it a little easier now. So these users here at the end were most likely uh, tweeted or retweeted or were mentioned in tweets that are listed up above. Now let's we'll search for hashtag Bluebird PS. So yesterday I actually tweeted this out, um, working on the Bluebird PS module. Major update will be arriving soon. You can see the source is Bluebird PS. Uh, it's got five like counts and it shows me as the um, as the author. Next, let's take a look at a tweet. So we see two people at the end, James and Bradley. And we also see two, um, two tweets themselves. So it looks like Bradley finished his, his talk. Good job, Bradley. And then looks like James retweeted it. Did you know that you can create a search and save it to use for later? Here are my current saved searches. You can see I'm interested in PS Tweet Chat, especially from Jeff and Paul Sheets, uh, PS Tweet Chat. Um, this was an older search uh, since the search itself does not go beyond seven days. And then also PS Follow Friday. Let's add one for post the PSH Summit since April 10th. Right, so we have it there. Remember the seven day max that I mentioned? It doesn't apply for the Twitter's website, but we can use these saved searches there. Let's take a look. And there you can see it. And let's go ahead and do the search. Not long after the speakers were announced, I created a public Twitter list for the speakers of this year's summit. By default, all Twitter lists are public. You can subscribe to any public list, and I encourage you to subscribe to this one. In the main Twitter website and the mobile apps, you're able to get tweets from all the members. There's 37 members now. If you're on the list, but would rather not be included, please let me know. And if you are a speaker and you're not on the list, but want to be, please let me know. And let's take a look at the actual member list. Tim, Micah, Bradley, and so on. Let's take a look at Twitter object. Let's take a look at the Twitter user object a little bit deeper. We see what appears to be two objects in the pipeline. We see the user object and what appears to be a tweet object as well. Let's use the get member to get more details. The two objects are full classes. As you can see, we have the Bluebird PS API V2 tweet info tweet, and also the Bluebird PS API V2 user info user. And you can also see like public metrics and withheld um, also have their own unique classes. Now I wanna briefly go over some basics of REST APIs. First, a REST API provides a way to interact or manipulate a resource, like a user or a book or movie programmatically. You may have used REST APIs without even knowing it. Social media sites like Twitter or Facebook or other sites like Amazon or Netflix all use APIs behind the pages that you click through. The web is literally built on APIs. 
you access EPS through URLs, which could include required bits of information, such as the resource identifier, or that information can be passed in the payload that is the body. Depending on your authentication and authorization, you may only have read access to data, or you may have access to read and update the data, or you may even be able to create or delete data. You can see that there are several actions which are loosely translates to the HTTP method, uh, create, read, update, and delete, otherwise known as CRUD. Um, they translate to post, get, put, and delete respectively. We'll now switch over to the Twitter API documentation site so it can show you a few key pages. In order to use Bluebird PS, you have to first apply for access. Um, and that really boils down to creating a developer account with, uh, with Twitter. Here you would apply for access. And that takes us to this next page. Apply for access, apply for a developer account. And then you'd have to go, you have to log in. And here I'm just gonna log in with that user account that I created for Bluebird PS. After you enter your authentication code, uh, you'll be taken to this site. Um, most likely going to be selecting hobbyists and then just building a tool for Twitter users or exploring the API. Uh, these will get you really to the same to the same thing. Then we can get started, and then you have to start. You have to fill this out. Um, I'm not going to continue with uh, Bluebird PS uh, because the application is already created uh, in my own personal account. Once you go through all of these screens, you'll end up needing to create a project and creating a application. Let's take a look at that in my account. So here you see that I have a project, Bluebird, and I also have the application Bluebird PS. Uh, you'll get a unique app ID. Uh, this is where you will assign permissions uh, whenever you get ready to, uh, to generate your keys and tokens. I do this here. Um, we'll talk more about the longevity of these keys and tokens. But for now, uh, just know that once you have them, you need to keep them safe and protected. Going back to the main Twitter API page, we can see uh, that they do have an early access for the Twitter API v2. Uh, there are several endpoints that they've been converting over. And also you can see for the Twitter API v11 that they have standard, premium, and enterprise tiers. The standard tier is the thing that we are really targeting. Again, that'll be covered a little later. And you can see here in the subscription levels that you only have seven days worth to search for, for tweets for the standard tier, um, or you have uh, access to the full archive uh, if you're on enterprise or premium. Uh, again, we're not gonna be doing the premium or the enterprise with Bluebird PS. So let's look at the Twitter API reference itself. So here are some of the here's some of the endpoints that they have, including the HTTP methods of like get, post, put. Um, so let's take a look at this one. Let's say we want to look at at a user. We can look at a user by the username. And this is the input endpoint URL. And where this resources you'll just put in the username like Bluebird PS or the Dave Carroll. You can see they also offer uh enterprise premium and for the standard v11 there are still a lot of things that it can do that the that they haven't migrated yet over to v2 uh such as 
doing anything with media or anything with direct messages. There's something with tweets uh, that you cannot do in V2 yet as well. You can see with the username, it supports OAuth 1OA and OAuth 2O. We'll talk more about these in a later slide. If you're interested in learning more about the Twitter API, um, I would highly suggest going to their site. Um, really, it's just, if you just type in dev twitter.com, you'll get to this. And then products, Twitter API. I read through the API documentation quite a bit before I even started writing any of my functions or module components. Now that that's out of the way, let's get back to the presentation. To recap, in order to get started with, with Bluebird PS or most Twitter API tools, you'll need to apply for a developer account, create a project and an app, apply for V2 access, and then set permissions when you generate your consumer keys and authentication token. Now that we're ready to start working with the API, let's talk about a few REST API clients. You want to use one of these to help you as you write your code. Um, so you see the invoke REST method. That's the one that I mentioned that you probably have already used. Uh, though we can't actually use that up front with the Twitter API because of how OAuth 1.0 actually works. Um, Twitter does provide a Postman collection for their V2 endpoints. Uh, so Postman is would be probably the best way to start uh, to kind of kick the tires, so to speak. Um, Insomnia Core is actually what I use to, uh, to do my testing with. You can also use Coral, and Twitter provides a version uh, called Twirl, which is Ruby-based, um, and you essentially have to authorize that application for your account, um, and then you can make requests against that. Also, there's a Visual Studio Code extension uh, that's a REST client. Let's uh, let's go ahead and jump into a um, Insomnia demo. So this is Insomnia Core. Um, I've already set up my environment, and this environment actually has my consumer keys and to uh, authorization tokens already set, so I can use those. I can refer to those basically with a variable. Um, and the interface for this, uh, potentially you could have a multi-part multi -part form, um, or you could send in a JSON text. Most of the things that you'll be dealing with would require either JSON or XML to be sent in. Also, there's the query part. So this actually, this will add the each of these things will add to the query sections. And of course, uh, if you needed to do any headers and your authentication, um, OAuth1 versus OAuth2. And there's also a bearer token down here. Uh, you notice also that you can use any of the HTTP methods, get, post, put, patch, delete, options, head. So yeah, let's just take a look at at this uh, Twitter user, get Twitter user v11. You can see my API keys are, are there. Uh, there's actually no body for this. And the query itself, um, I get this from the Twitter documentation, the Twitter API documentation. Uh, and then it tells me the parameters that it takes. So I'm just putting in these parameters. Um, and this URL preview is actually what is being sent to the Twitter API. Let's go ahead and, and hit send for that. It was the same thing because it was because it was cached. Uh, so you see this ID, ID string, screen underscore name. Um, this is the raw JSON from the V11 endpoint. Uh, you see the descriptions. Um, what else we've got? 
It was the last retweet that I did. Keep going down. Uh, the entities. Again, uh, entities are basically any hashtags or URLs that you may have in your in your tweet or your user profile. That was the include entities here list. Maybe you just set that to false. Also, this tweet mode extended. It's either extended or or compatible. Um, used to uh, tweets were much shorter, like I think half as as long as they are now. Let's see what this returns. Um, and this appears to be much shorter. Like we can see that this is truncated here. The text. Um, again, the text is truncated. Let's look at what the V2 output is. Um, you can see that there's actually a lot more on this uh, preview, the URL preview. Also, this is the, the URL. Like I was mentioning, the, the colon username was replaced with just the actual name that you're wanting to search for. With the Twitter V2 API, they have this idea called expansions and you have expansions for a user uh, and you also have ex uh, expansions for the tweets so for the user the only expansion there is is the pinned tweet id uh, so on your profile you know that you can actually pin your your tweets additionally there's user fields and tweet fields that you can specify what you want and this is for the most part all of the fields that you that that's potentially there uh, minus a few metrics that um, doesn't really pertain to to this again there's no body the oauth is the same version one for the header there's no header as well so let's send that and now we see this is we get the data back and also the includes uh, so the includes is these expansions. So this include is an actual tweet. And we can see that it's got reply settings, URLs, hashtags, uh, and so on. And then the data for this, you know, again, my username. Uh, notice they call it username instead of screen name. So that's a different. Uh, you can see the public metrics here um, following 16 yeah, like over 1,600 and 890 followers. Um, feel free to follow me after this, by the way, if you want. I tweeted a lot about PowerShell, if you hadn't guessed. Um, but anyway, let's go and look, take down some of these user fields. Uh, let's say I just want these user fields. And I don't want this expansion. And I don't want this, these tweet fields. So that's a much shorter list, a uh, much shorter URL. And if we do this, then we only get precisely what we asked to receive, uh, which is ID, username, name, created at, and the description. You notice that the created at time for the V2 is um, uh, properly, that's a proper date time. And on the V1, um, they use their own weird way of uh, tracking, tracking date time. That'll come up a little later as well. So same thing on the, on the tweets. Uh, there's quite a few... Uh, parameters that we would have to do for this and we'll just get this get this tweet Let me take a little bit of time. So this tweet ID uh, Just in case you're you're curious about that. You can actually get to that using um, Using the website. Let's get back over to Twitter And this is going to pull up any Any status and so or Status is the same thing as a tweet. Uh, so you see this. I'm just going to paste that uh, tweet ID that I that I received, and this is my um, 
chef skills, uh, culinary skills, that is. The tweet ID is, uh, you can, it's actually exposed in the web UI. All right, so back to the um, insomnia. Again, entities, um, you can see the entities for the media itself. And it includes the um, alt text. So the X alt text is for accessibility. It helps those that use screen readers to actually know what is in the image itself. And if we look at the, um, the uh, get tweet v2, um, I'm, it just uses this new URL. Um, there are multiple expansions. So author ID, reference tweet, um, entities, mentions, username, the list goes on and on. And then also we have the fields uh, specifically for tweets, for users, media, poll, and places. So when we send this, it's the same uh, tweet and the same media. Uh, but we don't actually get the alt text here. I'm probably going to have to find a way if, if the V2 offers the alt text. Um, it might be useful. And then we see that there's users. Uh, so my user as the author is there. And that's really a, the tour for uh, Insomnia. Um, as you can see, it helps you build out your URLs, uh, your, you know, the endpoints and the queries. Uh, you can validate your, your data. Um, also, you can validate your, your API keys. Yeah, so that's, that's about it. Let's switch back over to the presentation. So let's take a look at some design considerations. First off, what do I call it? What, what do we call it? Originally, this module was called just Twitter. Um, I reached out to a few PowerShell community members uh, to, to solicit them for a name. I don't recall who suggested Bluebird PS, but seeing how Twitter's iconography uses a Bluebird, I kind of thought that fit really well. Uh, but I didn't just stop once I found the name. Um, I searched the PowerShell gallery to see if there was anything related to Twitter and tweets. I also searched for the U.S. trademark public database. I found only a few products that related to the computer industry, and none were focused on PowerShell. So Bluebird PS it was. Soon after, I also created a Twitter account for Bluebird PS, primarily to secure it, like I said, for so no one else could grab it. Um, and as I was prepping for this session, I registered bluebirdps.dev domain. Um, by creating the name and ensuring it's unique it's, and registering it with supporting sites or services, it's all part of the branding for your, for your product. And the product is the, the module. Branding is, is something important for you as a person if you get more involved in the community. What PowerShell version should it support? For this module, I targeted PowerShell 7 for three reasons. One, the web commandlets are considerably different between Windows PowerShell and PowerShell 7. Um, I'd already dealt with those differences in another module and I didn't want to deal with those here. Uh, primarily the error handling and how it outputted errors. Second, most CI pipelines are Linux-based and PowerShell 7 is cross-platform. And third, PowerShell 7 is a long-term servicing release. Why not use the latest and greatest? So next, how should it handle authentication? And does the API use sessions? As I touched on a few minutes ago, the Twitter API uses access or consumer keys and secrets along with authentication tokens and secrets, and also potentially bearer tokens for authentication. Unfortunately, all of these are fairly static, meaning that unless you regenerate your keys and tokens, you can use them for months or even longer. Uh, because of this, I decided to store the authentication data in an encrypted file on disk. More of that when we discuss the authentication component of the module. Not all APIs use static authentication like the Twitter API. For instance, I created and maintained the uh, Posh Dyn DNS API module, which interacts with Dyn DNS managed service. They use a JWT or bearer token, which is generated from a user's login. 
the session lasts for about 30 minutes, maybe an hour max. So it doesn't make so it didn't make sense to actually store that token on disk. I had a connect dying DNS session and a disconnect dying DNS session uh, commands to create or destroy the session token. For both of these modules, the authentication data is stored in a module scoped variable. Now, what endpoints for functionality do I focus on? Beyond getting tweets and users and searching for tweets, I wanted to be able to publish tweets and even include media or videos or pics and also need to be able to edit my uh, Twitter list membership or even create Twitter lists. And what, tra what product track or tier should it support? Uh, the standard 1.1 and V2 tiers are currently the only tracks that I want to support. Yeah, I could, there's an academic research track which requires additional and I assume more stringent approvals. And the premium and enterprise tracks, frankly, just cost money. Um, and how do I handle the V2 expansions and various field lists that we looked at just a few minutes ago? My general thought is to return all the expansions and include all fields for whatever data types. That way, I can let the user decide what they want to display. They would have access to anything that their permissions allow. So let's talk about the module components. Um, authentication first. Um, so OAuth v1 is user context. Um, it's what the Twitter API v11 supports. Um, it's also the default for Bluebird PS. It authorizes each call using the endpoint and query information to generate the authorization mm -hmm. header. Uh, so every call that you actually make against it, even uh, paged calls, uh, paged uh, iterations, will have to go through um, the process of generating a new header, authorization header. The Twitter API v2, there are some endpoints that actually supports OAuth v2, but you really aren't going to be getting the public, publicly accessible data. Um, and the uh, bearer token is uh, the, uh, the Java web token, and it authorizes each call. I'm actually using the OAuth v1 as the default for Bluebird, uh, unless I absolutely have to use the bearer token. In order to generate this authorization header, I created a OAuth parameters class. It, it creates the header, the signatures, kind of complex to get through uh, all of the steps. I also provide a module scope variable of OAuth um, that holds the API key, secret, access token, and secret, and also the bearer token. Um, and also provide commands to securely set, import, export, and test the authentication. So let's talk about module components, uh, the private functions. Uh, the private functions are the things that I wrote that interacts you know, directly with the Twitter API or uh, process the output, processes errors, things like that. The invoke Twitter request is the, really the, the linchpin of the, of the module. Um, it can talk to the, um, the V2 endpoints, the V1 endpoints, V11 endpoints. Um, and if it detects the uh, V2 pagination, since it adheres to more, uh, to better standards, uh, it will automatically pull the next data set. Uh, it also is where the data is parsed and is converted into the appropriate classes. For the V11 Twitter API, some of the endpoints uses page requests, some use cursor requests, uh, and it's probably indicative of having multiple teams work on the, this huge API that, that they have. Uh, I write the output. Uh, when I do that, I send it to the information stream, uh, or let, I send the request information or the response information actually to the information stream. I kind of tuck that information in because uh, I think it would be kind of nice for, for people to know how long did the, this uh, request take, you know, maybe what server did it uh, connect to, uh, what was the actual return values, you know, that wasn't, um, um, that wasn't already processed or anything like that. I provide access to that in a module history variable. Um, I generate the queries for the version 1.1 
of the API using the PSBound parameters val variable, uh, basically as, as input. And there's a few more other private functions as well. So let's look at the module components of the um, public functions and help. Um, I wanted the functions to adhere to the verb noun naming scheme uh, and the verb must be an approved verb. Uh, there must be advanced functions. So the commandlet binding needs to be there and they must rely on parameter validation and to use should process for any remove functions. There's basically two types of functions. One that calls one or more Twitter API endpoints and those that don't call any Twitter API at all. Uh, for the module help, I'm using the platypus to generate the markdown files and to generate the external help mammal. Uh, and I also use read the docs to provide the online help. Additionally, um, I provide a history um, of all of the commands that you've sent to Twitter. And it's, it, I store that in a module scoped variable. Uh, moving on uh, to the actual C sharp classes. Um, so I wanted to provide uh, classes to strongly type pretty much everything that the API gives me. And I decided to use C sharp uh, classes because uh, you can use namespaces, which provides a logical hierarchy like bluebird dot api v2 dot user info dot user or um you know going off of the user info namespace a sub namespace of metrics with public uh because there's actually different types of metrics so i use the class inheritance uh virtually all classes inherit from twitter object which includes the original object property and has a get original object method. Um, this original object property basically has stuff, the object that I get from uh, from the Twitter API directly into that. And it's available for the end users to use if they need it. Uh, I also have the, the Bluebird PS helpers class has several static methods like uh, convert v1 date, um, to title case. Um, it also is where uh, the, the information that comes from the V2 endpoints are actually parsed, essentially creates or instantiates whatever object is needs to be instantiated. Um, and some, uh, some classes actually override the two string. Um, so if you don't have the two string uh, overridden and you're looking at a nested property like public metrics is a nested property of of a tweet and also a user uh, you would just see the bluebird ps uh api v2 user info metrics and public whereas when i overwrote when i overrode the two string method i'm actually using some code that will and no matter what kind of properties is on that object it will provide a just a comma separated list of the property name and then the value uh, like you see there. So the public metrics, uh, this again is for me, the follower count of 889, follower, following count of 1614, things like that. Um, so this makes uh, looking at nested objects a little cleaner, um, nicer to the, to the eyes. And you still have access to all of that as a, as a you know, its own, its own object. Um, so what's next? Uh, well, obviously I need to continue with all the API v2 functions. I need to provide some custom exceptions, regardless of which API version is used. Uh, I need to create some pester test and I need to add Bluebird PS to the Twitter community tools and libraries page. And I need more community involvement on the next slide we'll see where you can join the discussion please uh, come to the bluebird ps repo and uh, ask your questions um, if you want to see the code itself look at the github repo if you're are if you know that you need uh, to use bluebird ps uh, go ahead and look at the um, uh, the getting started and also I'll provide the the links for the apply for the twitter developer account and also just the general Twitter developer resources.
Well, that's it for my for my session. Uh, I appreciate you spending time with me and hope you've learned something about not only creating uh, you know, how I created Bluebird PS, but also some pointers on how you might be able to create modules that supports uh, REST APIs. So thank you very much.